Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and this is module 8 on non-infectious diseases and disorders. We're going to start off by looking at homeostasis. So your learning intention or your learning goal for this particular video is to be able to construct and interpret negative feedback loops that show homeostasis by using a range of sources, including but not limited to temperature. So we want you to be able to define the term homeostasis to contrast the two important stages of homeostasis and then perhaps to be able to draw and discuss a negative feedback loop that involves the uh, maintenance of homeostasis with a particular reference to body temperature. So the first thing I guess we need to do is to define homeostasis. And homeostasis is defined as the process by which uh, organisms maintain a relatively stable internal environment. Most of the time when you're looking at homeostasis, you're looking at pretty much a seesaw. And the seesaw is kind of trying to sit in balance. Another uh, way of thinking about homeostasis is to think about a thermostat. Now what will happen is that there will be some fluctuations away from the um, stable value and small fluctuations are okay. But larger fluctuations can actually have implications on the way different chemicals like enzymes, for example, function in the body and they may actually put the body at some risk. And so therefore, we need to be able to respond quickly to changes that occur either in the external environment or the internal environment. Now there's going, we're going to talk a little bit more about the types of systems that are involved in this, but primarily there are two, the nervous system and the endocrine system. And these two systems uh, work together in order to detect changes that are happening both internally and externally, and also to interpret those changes and to respond appropriately. Now we have talked about, um, or we looked at the nervous system and how it does this before. Sensory organs are designed to uh, provide information about what's going on in the outside world. The control center, so the brain and the spinal cord, is where those signals will come to initially. And they may uh, initiate an automatic response, such as in a reflex, uh, or there may be a uh, more considered response that we might provide to some sort of uh, sense from our external environment. Either way, uh, whether this is a, a reflex arc that's simply going to go back to a motor neuron, whether it's something that perhaps has gone through and been analyzed by a hypothalamus in our brain uh, in order to then adjust the system in order to respond to whatever that chain is, effectors, muscles and glands, are the uh, components that are going to uh, bring about that response. So we need to make sure that we have a detection of the change and then a response. And then I guess importantly, uh, because this is a feedback system, we need the sense organs to provide information about what's happened as a response um, to the initial system. So. We have a response, uh, we have a detection, we have a response, and then we have a monitoring system that basically feeds that information back into whether or not if we, for example, have uh, moved our seesaw, whether we've moved it back into the uh, equilibrium position again. Because one of the things that's important is that when a response begins, we want to make sure that we turn that response off once we've re-established our equilibrium position. So that means we need to look then at a negative feedback loop. So this is an example of a negative feedback loop. It comes from um, the Victorian system, uh, but it's a really nice little loop and an easy way for us to get a bit of an idea of what we're just talking about. So it's our sensory organs that are going to sense changes in our environment, monitor variables, and inform the effectors if there is uh, some change or some variable that we note is not at the value that it should be. And this is whether the variable that we're after, so we've, we've said we're talking about temperature in this case. So if the temperature that's detected is too high, then we have one set of responses that are designed to lower temperature, and that would be um, following this loop. Uh, but if the temperature, for example, was too low, then we'd have a different set of responses uh, and they would follow a different loop. So you can see um, that in terms of negative feedback, 
the, the reason we call it negative is because we're trying to do the opposite. So there may be certain systems where we actually want more of something. That would be a positive loop. We've seen a change. We want to have even more of, of whatever that change was. That would be a positive uh, feedback loop. Yep, we've got more. Keep going. Keep doing more and more and more. But a negative feedback loop is one that reverses whatever the change is. Uh, were. So if the temperature goes too high, we want to bring it down. If the temperature goes too low, we want to bring it up. And we want to monitor these systems to make sure that these changes are happening uh, and that the responses that we've provided have been effective. So far, we've talked um, in sort of general terms, so we want to get a little bit more specific. In terms of homeostasis, firstly, there are two very important stages. The first one is detecting a change from the stable state. So uh, all of the important components uh, that, that may be monitored, things like temperature, uh, water balance, water levels, uh, salts, glucose, these are all things that are monitored in the body. Uh, and they're all things that need to be kept within certain stable ranges. And if they aren't within those little ranges, then we have to detect that they're outside of those ranges. And then secondly, we have to counteract that change. And this is where we're talking about a negative system. So if any of these levels falls too low, then we want to respond in a way that brings those levels back up and vice versa. And this is all under the control uh, of the hypothalamus, a very important region in our brains. And the hypothalamus is a nice link between the nervous and the endocrine systems. And it's one of the things that's going to monitor something like blood temperature, which we're looking at in this particular video. The signals that are sent can either be chemical in nature, and chemical tends to come from the endocrine system through the production of hormones. And then there are electrical systems which are going to come from the nervous system. Um, and these ones will travel much more quickly and the response will be uh, faster than for the chemical signals. So we've got these two different systems working together, firstly to detect changes from the stable state and secondly to counteract those changes. So in temperature regulation, there are two things basically that can happen. The first thing is that the temperature can start to fall and we can start to realize that it's getting cold simply through thermoreceptors in our skin. We can tell then that the temperature is dropping. Maybe we're not wearing sufficient clothes, so we may need to put on a jumper or something to help warm up. But our bodies are also going to respond in, a, in different ways to those falls in temperature. So if we, get a, if we detect a fall in temperature, then we're going to firstly have uh, something called vasoconstriction. So if you constrict something, you squeeze it. So blood vessels are constricted. That often pulls blood away from the extremities. So we can look pale and it's going to conserve blood to the key organs uh, internally, which is your heart, your lungs, your brain. The, the organs that most need them are the ones that are going to um, be the ones that uh, get that supply of blood as the temperature is falling and it's going to move away from the extremities where it's going to cool uh, more quickly. We don't uh, perspire, but we can shiver. Contraction of the muscles generates heat and that can be something that helps to warm the, the body. If these strategies have been successful and our body will start to warm, uh, it'll keep that heat in and we'll end up perhaps returning back to that normal body temperature, in which case the system will stop um, putting in all these mechanisms for uh, low temperature. The reverse, of course, is if the temperature rises, and if the temperature rises, then we're often doing um, the opposite things. So now instead of vasoconstriction, we have vasodilation. So think about pupils dilating, they open really wide. When the blood vessels open really wide, we get more blood. If that blood is, is happening to capillaries on the surface, then you're going to have them turn red. So often people who've, who've, uh, whose body temperature is quite high, say if they've been exercising, you can see uh, red patches. And those red patches is that vasodilation with the blood vessels opening up and bringing blood to the surface. Now, why would they want to do that? Well, because going with that is often perspiration or sweating. And that that produces water on the surface, and as that water um, changes from a liquid to a gas, it takes heat away from the body. So if we bring blood close to the surface where heat is being extracted, that can help cool it, 
and that evaporative cooling uh, is what helps to bring our body temperature back down again. So remember, if it goes up, we want to bring it down. If it goes down, we want to do something to bring it back up again. So that's the principle behind a negative feedback system. It's also the importance of homeostasis. But we'll have another look at an example or an application of homeostasis in the next video. Thanks for watching.